Good morning. And my name is Sandrine Rastello. I'm the Bureau Chief for Bloomberg in Montreal. On behalf of Bloomberg, I want to welcome you to the third session of the Bloomberg Canadian Fixed Income Conference. The Canadian Fixed Income Conference is the eighth annual session of its kind, and it brings together some of the biggest names in commodities, bonds, credit, you name it. Usually we have an action packed day in person. This time, due to the circumstances, we have six sessions. And I really encourage you to go to our agenda page to see what's already happened and maybe watch some past sessions and check out what's coming next. Today, we have a very interesting session on one of Canada's most important industries, energy. Um, we'll hear about different segments of that industry from drilling to midstream operations to power. You'll hear from some of the biggest players and how they're dealing with the current challenges. But first of all, before I move on to the program, I want to um, thank our sponsor, National Bank of Canada, and a few housekeeping things. If you have any problem with audio or video, you can try to refresh your browser. And if you still have another issue, there's a little box in the, the bottom right corner, I guess, where you can uh, get some help. You can also submit some questions. There's a white tab on the right hand of your screen. Please write your name, where you're from, and uh, to the extent possible, we'll get to your question. And last but not least, in the era of social media, we have a hashtag that we ask you to kindly use. It's Bloomberg CFI. Um, yeah, Bloomberg CFI. So now I'm going to give the floor for a few minutes to Catherine Loubier, the Delegate General of Quebec in New York, to launch the conference. See you soon. I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you, Bloomberg and National Bank of Canada. The Bloomberg Fixed Income Conference touches on important topics year after year and brings insight to all participants. The National Bank of Canada has been a true partner of the Quebec office in New York and to the Quebec government over the past years. This year, we celebrate 80 years of presence of Quebec in New York, and we truly value this partnership. Now, no two nations depend more on each other for their mutual prosperity and security than the United States and Canada. Quebec exports U.S. 70 billion to the world, of which 70% goes south of the border. New York State is the province's biggest customer, taking in more than 5.5 billion in export. Now, to put this into perspective, we export as much to New York than as France, Germany, and the U.K. and China combined. Our economies are so intertwined and our critical supply chains are so tightly linked that any given product can cross the border several times before it gets to market. Simply put, we depend on each other and we compete together. We were able to show evidence of this recently on aluminum trade, and it led to the repeal of unwarranted lose-lose tariffs by the U.S. on Canadian aluminum. Now, Quebec produces 90% of our Canadian aluminum and is the top supplier to the U.S., since the Great War. Canada is also leading and the leading and most secure, reliable, and competitive supplier of energy to the United States. And you'll hear about that today, including crude oil, refined petroleum products, natural gas from Alberta, renewable hydropower from Quebec, and uranium from Saskatchewan. Quebec's utility, Hydro-Quebec, is North America's largest producer of renewable energy. You'll hear today from its first female CEO, Sophie Brochu. Hydro-Quebec has been providing renewable electricity to the U.S. for over 100 years, and more export projects are being advanced, uh, notably in Massachusetts and New York State, to help them reach their pollution reduction targets. But that will only be possible if we work together and if we rebound from COVID-19 together. As we've heard on this stage, and we'll hear again for sure, it's in the interest of the U.S., Canada, and Quebec to continue to rebuild our economies together as we recover from COVID-19. I look forward to more insights from the distinguished speakers at the Bloomberg Fixed Income Conference 2020. Thank you. Bonjour, Sophie. Bonjour, Sandrine. So, it's now been... I think about to the day six months since you took over Hydro-Québec, a company that has a very important significance for the province and very big ambitions for the, the region. Um, 
you know, you had plans for a sabbatical, writing a book, learning, teaching, and the government came calling. You took that job, but 20,000 employees, I believe, in the middle of the pandemic. Tell us, what was the first decision you made? Well, the first decision you make is not to take over IDO Quebec. Uh, you actually join a formidable uh, organization. And uh, the first decision uh, I made with myself was to make sure that we were uh, uh, adopting a mental posture of elevating ourselves to uh, a greater good than just our own need. And actually, that's one of the reasons I joined uh, IDO Quebec. A very specific decision I take was to make sure that our management committee would have the, the parity zone between women and men. Um, it was due. Uh, it's now the case. And uh, I believe it's helped us, it helps us to uh, make a better decision. We often, take a, we often talk about you know, the importance of parity, of diversity uh, in management, on boards. Is there anything that these appointments have already changed, you think, in the view, um, you know, or, or, or the decisions that have been made since? Well, you know, I, I, I think uh, there is not a, a casserole, there is not a breakup point. I think collectively, uh, the world now recognizes that uh, we have humongous challenges in front of us and that we need to tap into all the talent, the brightness, the experience. Uh, that we can, and this means uh, as much as we can uh, quickly uh, to get to equality of representation between men and women around, around decision-making tables, would that be small projects, uh, executive table, board tables, uh, but we cannot stop that. Uh, uh, you know, the diversity of culture, again, of experience is going to be formidably uh, important because we have world challenges that need worldwide experience, uh, look at, and, and contributions. Uh, in particular, I know you've been uh, looking at visible minorities at Hydro-Quebec, and uh, you know, you're, you're aiming to, to increase that percentage. Do you have any goals for the next two years, perhaps, or five years? Have you set yourself some goals for that? Well, we have goals, but frankly speaking, I am behind goals, uh, quantitative goals. Uh, the goal I have is to make sure that, again, we develop a mental posture regarding diversity that will go beyond what the law requires or whatever quotas we can get uh, or specific uh, uh, numbers that we can have. Again, it's a matter of doing the right thing for the people themselves, for the company, and ultimately for the society as a whole. So you don't have quotas at this at this stage? Or? Yeah, no, it's not a matter of quota. I am not I am not fond of quotas. I think we need we I would say to give you an image, when we walk down the streets in Montreal, we see a reality. I would like that I do Quebec within its walls uh, would uh, would display the same reality. That would be the goal. So um, maybe we can talk a little bit about the situation when you arrived. Um, we've seen the financial resource for Hydro-Quebec for the first half of the year, and you know it's a reflection of demand going down in Quebec, but also in your export market. Where are things now? I mean, of course, I'm speaking from Quebec, where you know a whole part of the economy has just been shut down again. But did you get a sense in the second half of the year, in the first few months of the second half, that demand was getting back to, say, normal levels? Oh, I think it will take some time, uh, Sandri, and it will take some time. And uh, as we speak, we are embarking what in what seems to be a second wave of this thing. So it would be very presumptuous for me to, uh, to even say what I do believe will be uh, the rebound time. What I do know, though, is that uh, more than ever, we need to be working very hard and uh, not only within our respective regions, but elevating again ourselves and look on the horizon and say, we need to work together. Everybody needs to work together because we're in it together. So we have a choice to make. Uh, and the choice is how are we going to invest the money to kickstart uh, the economy on its rebound? And we have a choice. We have a choice to invest a dollar for a dollar in one crisis we have a choice to use the same dollar to work on two crises at the same time, i.e. Uh, getting out of the ditch uh, economically wise, collectively, 
and, and uh, working on this energy transition that is uh, so required. So that's, uh, that's how I see things moving on. I do Quebec is very solid, financially speaking, uh, and we know we are privileged in that regard. That said, we have a responsibility toward our customers, and, and many of them are suffering. So we're working very hard to help them go through this period. Uh, we're going to, uh, to uh, be an active player in our economy to, uh, to see how we can maybe advance some of the investments we would have made maybe a bit later. Not making investment we don't need, for, for sure, investment that we will be required, but maybe do them in advance to help our economy. But beyond that, what I really hope for and dream for and work for is to make sure that as a region, when we look at, at our neck of the wood, and I'm not talking only Quebec here, but the, the whole northeast of the continent, how can we work better to make sure that we serve energy to the cheapest cost possible to our customer and to have the cleanest energy possible for them to use? And I'm, I'm going to get back to that in a minute. But just in terms of demand, I mean, do you see some improvement, though? Yes, we did. We did see uh, some improvement, and uh, some uh, some areas industrially uh, are on the, the the rebound. What I'm saying is that uh, again, I, I think it's very presumptuous to say it's going to hold on, it's going to increase again. I think we need to advance. I am uh, I am personally optimistic by nature. But I am also uh, very, uh, very cautiously uh, looking at the reality right now. And uh, we, we were privileged in Canada and in Quebec to have a good financial situation from the outset. So I do believe that we're going to go through this. I do Quebec will kick back. Our customers will, will uh, come back. But we need to do it swiftly and, again, collectively invest our money so intelligently. Money is precious. Money is really precious. So, so speaking of, were there some projects that you had to put on the to put on the back burner because of COVID? I think, especially overseas, not mentioning the U.S., but further away, you had some ambitions that that you had to dial back a little bit. Frankly, it was not a dialing back; it was using another phone. Uh, and uh, uh, if I was to use uh, that analogy, um, a few years ago. Uh, it, in the 90s, I do Quebec invested a lot of money successfully in acquiring infrastructures uh, in the rest of the world. That was then and this is now. And now uh, these plays are really plays of pension funds, uh, I do believe. And the capital cost is so low within their hands. I do Quebec is not a pension fund. We're not a financial player. We are an industrial uh, uh, operator. So if we do acquire a company anywhere in the world, it, it will be because we will bring something to the table, industrially speaking. That's it. Right now, and even before the pandemic, I believe that North America presents a, a whole bunch of opportunities for a lot of us to work together. And when I look at focusing the energy, focusing the, the, the human resources and talent, I think there is a lot to do uh, on the continent right now. Um, Research-wise, uh, it will be worthwhile. We have partnerships across, across the world, but I don't see our people you know, uh, traveling the world to find a company to, uh, to buy. And before I buy a disrupt LDC in South America, uh, I think there is uh, better things for us to do in our neck of the wood right now. So let's talk about the neck of the wood. Um, everybody, I think, now is wondering what is going on with New York. There, there is a political will that's been openly expressed, uh, but nothing's happening. So could you tell us what the main hurdle is at this, at this stage? Well, I wouldn't say that nothing is happening. Uh, this is probably a, a place where pandemic uh, circumstances uh, uh, stop conversations for a while. But right now, I think all the stars are aligned, frankly speaking, for a, a transmission uh, line to be built, project to be built. We are having very productive conversations with both the government and the cities in New York. Uh, New York has given itself very ambitious, uh, ambitious goals. And uh, so the time, the time uh, is now. We are working very hard to make it happen, and we're having those conversations as we speak. So what's uh, what's what's holding it back? Because these conversations have been going for a while, and I, and I know COVID has probably, you know, of course, kept everyone very busy. Is there something specific that is still a hurdle? 
Yeah, the specificity, and I think, and I think it's a it's an important uh, uh, message for B to carry. I think, uh, and maybe I am naive here, uh, Sandrine, but I like to be because I think that in those circumstances we have to be. I am naive in the sense that I think that the time has gone where everybody needs to think about energy on a competitive basis. There are so many things to do, so much to realize, so huge challenges to, uh, to overtake that we now need to think about our respective capacities as complementary. Ido Quebec is not coming to the market to displace anybody. Uh, and we certainly want to work hard in helping, for example, New York State in building its own uh, renewable energy and any states in the U.S. to build its own renewable energy. When we do that, we'll be providing energy for sure, but we would like, and that's what we see, we, we want the people to understand that the big uh, hydroelectricity reservoir that we have is actually the greatest battery and the cheapest battery than people uh, south of the border may have to back up their own uh, wind projects or solar projects, wherever they are. Um, so when I look at what is needed in New York for, for, for a while, and I think it's fair to say uh, maybe people saw Ido Quebec as being very invasive, very big, and flooding the market, which is absolutely not the case. So um, right now, what we need is to have hydroelectricity be recognized as a renewable energy that is bringing something very tangible, env environmentally speaking. Ido Quebec can be any renewable uh, energy prices uh, in the U.S. We can meet and even beat the price. But we need to be recognized as this, as this, uh, with this contribution. If we can have that, then uh, we can we can absorb uh, uh, through uh, through our pricing the price of the uh, the line that needs to uh, to be built. So that's uh, that's what uh, I wouldn't say is missing. That's the link that we need uh, to put together again. I am pretty optimistic that the conversations we're having right now uh, will see through uh, the light of day. So for you to be recognized as that, it's a commission that has to declare you as a renewable, and it, and it, that goes into subsidies. Is that right? Well, uh, I I I I don't like the word subsidies. Uh, uh, I think that what we need is for any renewable energy to be rec whatever it is to be recognized with its contribution. And uh, if you are working in an environment where there is no uh, a price on carbon, then there is not an implicit price into alternatives. So you need to have every renewable energy to be uh, to be seen as a contributor to reduce that carbon price, uh, this uh, this uh, carbon footprint. So and again, I, I I I believe that the conversations we're having will will uh, will uh, allow for that. It will be up Your to the, uh, the New York. It will be up to the New York authorities to elect and decide how they want to go about it. So you, I sense. I mean, you you sound to like you're optimistic. It's going to be recognized as a, as a renewable. Well, I am optimistic, and my optimism comes from the fact that the the uh, the the, uh, the goals that the state has given itself, rightfully so, are very challenging. And in order for uh, the state to be able to uh, to uh, to uh, acknowledge all the uh, renewable energy that will be uh, provided, for example, uh, from the offshore wind, uh, at, at one point there will need to be some balancing. There will need to be a line. There will be uh, a need for access to the reservoir. Uh, we've been building capacity for the last uh, for the last 30 years, uh, more so in the last 12. For the last 30 years, no line were built going south of the border. We have two uh, very important projects in front of us right now. This, these are what uh, we are working on, and I, I am very, uh, I am, uh, I am profoundly convinced that uh, our neck of the wood, our region, the whole U.S. and, and Canada, and Northeast, uh, have a formidable opportunity to think globally. Uh, using our own com competitive advantage and comparative advantage, but we will be so brighter, more intelligent. We will develop our uh, uh, economies much faster and more uh, in a more cleaner way if we do work together. That's my conviction. And this is why I, I, I embarked into this great uh, journey at Ido Quebec. That's my fundamental belief 
the time is gone for having each our own toys and tonka in our sandboxes. We need to share. So your predecessor had opened the door to opening another, to building, sorry, another big dam in, in the future. Is that something, given the circumstances and given, you know, the, the way people feel about dams, is it still something on the table? Uh, it's not because of what the people feel about dams, because dams, uh, well done, can be, uh, can be great. It's about the reality of the market. So I will never say that there won't be any dams uh, built anymore in Quebec. I, who am I to say something like that? But I don't see that in the short to medium term. Uh, and the reason being that, you know, for a long, long time, the, uh, the, the utilities and the way the energy industry was built, being in the, in the oil, gas, you know, I, I ran a natural gas theater, so I know what I'm talking from. So energy was thought starting with the production, then the transportation, the transmission, then distribution, and then the customer. Well, the reality is that today we need to turn this thing upside down. And this is why it's so, uh, so suffering for industries, because we need to start from the customer, who happened to be a citizen, who happened to be a taxpayer, and who happened to have environmental hopes. We start from that individual, and then we build the system up. Obviously, it's an image, you don't spin industries like that, but if you start with the customer and you understand that there will be uh, distributed production, when you understand that there will be solar roof on, 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 their, on their houses, when you understand that they will have uh, uh, electric, uh, electric cars where we'll be able to use the battery if there is a disruption in the service, the whole notion of reliability becomes uh, very, very uh, uh, legitimate and important, but you start thinking about the system very differently. So, coming back to your answer, to your question, we need to start from the customer, not from the dams. So I don't uh, see that in the, in the short term. And just efficiency uh, uh, programs, let, let me give you an example. We need to increase that. Uh, we need, as utilities, we, uh, as energy providers, we need to help the citizen, the taxpayer, the, 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 the individual to use less of what we sell them. It is our responsibility. But in the last uh, uh, 15 years, I do Quebec deployed efficiency programs that are the exact equivalent, it's, a, it's just a, like that, of 10 terawatt hours. 10 terawatt hours is the contract that I do Quebec signed with Massachusetts. So it's a dam in itself. And we have that around us. You have that uh, around you in New York. And you know what? For example, New York and its boroughs have the same population than we have in the overall Quebec. Right there in New York, there is a, a, a humongous well of, of energy efficiency and, and, and uh, that, that delays or maybe prevent uh, costly investments. So the, the, the thing is not a financial thing. The thing is a consumer's driven thing. We don't have a lot of time left. I'd like to ask you, what's the biggest opportunity to sell more power at home, would you say? Is it electric cars, um, cryptocurrency mining, hydrogen data center, in, in your short answer? Yeah, I, 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 and again, I, I, I am picky on the words, but uh, it's, it's the opportunity not to sell uh, energy, it's the opportunity to use energy more efficiently. So hydrogen is clearly uh, something that uh, is very important to Hydro Quebec. Uh, this is the next frontier. You know, hydrogen is not an end in itself. It's a mean to something else. When you look across the world, uh, everybody has a piece, an ingredient of the recipe. Nobody really made the cake rise yet. Uh, but definitely, if you have green energy, renewable energy, and you can make green hydrogen, uh, this is going to be a very uh, interesting uh, journey for us. Uh, you can use hydrogen as a fuel to move cars. You can inject it in natural gas distribution system to make it renewable. One day, you will capture uh, CO2, you will mix it with clean uh, hydrogen, and you will put it in networks, and it will be completely renewable natural gas, and we will be able to electrify uh, thermal loads that uh, today need to be served with fossil fuels. That's the future. That's frankly the next frontier for Hydro Quebec. 
had more questions, but uh, our time is up. So uh, thank you, Sophie, for taking the time to speak with us. Well, it was a pleasure. I am grateful for the opportunity to be with all of you. Be safe uh, and be happy. Thanks, Andrine. Um, and uh, thanks for joining us for this panel. Um, we have three excellent speakers today talking about the Canadian upstream um, oil uh, um, sector. Um, first off, we have Derek Aylesworth. He is the Chief Financial Officer of Seven Generations. Um, then we have Rod Gray, who's the Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Baytex, followed by Lars Glemzer, Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Vermilion Energy. Um, thanks for joining us, gentlemen. Thanks, good thanks for having me. Um, <laughs> so, uh, wanted to start off and just kind of go through in each person, and if you could tell us a little bit about your company and how you guys have been surviving um, the year of um, the pandemic. Um, Derek, if we could start with you. Sure, thanks. Uh, so, I'm the Chief Financial Officer for Seven Generations. Uh, Seven Gens is a uh, Western Canadian producer. We're exclusively operating in the Montney Formation. The Montney is one of Canada's largest resource plays. Uh, we uh, uh, focus largely on the liquids rich, and uh, as a result, we're Canada's largest condensate producer. The company today is guiding to produce between 175 and 185,000 BOE per day for the 2020 calendar year. Uh, condensate is a bit of a unique product in Western Canada. It's the only hydrocarbon product that's structurally short in Canada. The primary use of condensate is as a diluent for oil sands producers to blend with their production to allow the product to flow down a pipeline. Today, Canada's needs for that product are in the range of about 700,000 barrels per day, and Canada produces about 420,000. So uh, the, that, that uh, structural shortage we foresee continuing, and I think that bodes well for the outlook for the commodity price. Uh, how we've done during the pandemic, uh, like everyone, this was a challenging, challenging year. Uh, last year, we were producing about 200,000 barrels a day. And coming into the 2020 year, we had set a preliminary budget last November to invest $1.1 billion in a capital program. Uh, with the combination of the Saudi and Russia price war and demand destruction from the pandemic, we uh, reset our budget earlier in the year to a capital expenditure level that we thought would be able to be self-funded in the prevailing commodity price environment at the time. That resulted in us pulling our capital budget back to $650 million, and there was a consequent reduction in our productive capacity down from about 200,000 barrels a day last year to that range that I quoted earlier. Uh, at, that, at that expenditure level, we do think we'll be able to self-fund this year. In fact, uh, with a modest recovery in commodity prices from since we made that adjustment, we're now expecting a degree of free cash flow generation this year. So in addition to pulling back our capital program, uh, we did get very, very aggressive with our hedging program when we started to see signals that commodity prices could soften. Uh, we locked in about 85% of our WTI exposure for the balance of the 2020 year at just over $45 WTI. Uh, and we, that, that level of hedging carries on through the first quarter of next year. Um, uh, we uh, recently started to see condensate prices uh, improve as oil sands production has come back online. And uh, we think we're well positioned for a continuation of our uh, commodity price recovery. Great. Thank you. Um, Rod, tell us a little bit about Baytex and what you, how uh, you guys are surviving uh, this year. <laughs> sure. Thanks, Catherine. Um, similar to Derek, it's been a, it's been a very challenging year. Um, we got started off the year um, very busy on the capital um, front. We, we basically issued a new series of bonds, uh, which are due 2027. Um, and we actually took the opportunity to retire a bunch of uh, other bonds that were maturing in 2021 and 2022. And so um, what that did is give us the opportunity to renegotiate our bank credit facilities out to 2024, which is our nearest uh, term maturity. So just a little bit of background on, on Baytex. We are a um, basically an oil and gas producer, predominantly crude oil and liquids. We have properties in Alberta and Saskatchewan in, in uh, Canada. And then we also have a, a, a non-operated interest in the Eagleford. Uh, our production would be split about 60% to Canada 
which is kind of a mix of uh, heavy oil and light oil, and then uh, the light oil properties that we would have in the U.S. and the Eagle Bird. Um, 2019 was a great year for us. Um, you know, WTI averaged about just over uh, $56, and we were able to generate over $300 million of free cash flow. And we've been really uh, focusing on trying to generate free cash flow to delever our balance sheet. We, uh, we've had a little bit more debt than we wanted to when we came into the commodity price downturn. And so we've been adjusting our plans to uh, basically create free cash flow and deleverage the balance sheet. But the activities at the start of the year were really focused on, um, you know, that, that sending out the new series of bonds and basically um, setting up our maturity stack. And then quite quickly after that, we, we got into the COVID response. And our initial response was basically ensuring the safety and health of our personnel as well as the uh, our operations. And that quickly evolved into once we had people working from home, which happened very quickly, um, retooling the business. And so uh, give you an example, we spent just over $177 million in Q1. Um, we basically stopped capital spending in Canada and moderated our pace of development in the U.S. And in Q2, we invested only $10 million in our assets, and we were still able to actually generate free cash flow during Q2, which was an extremely volatile period. We're now focused on 2021 and what our plans are looking for 2021. And I'd say our, our focus is really on retooling the business to, uh, to the new commodity price environment. And so. Um, if we're in a 40 to $45 environment, we're basically spending enough cash flow to keep operations stable. And then as, um, as commodity prices improve, we're looking to take the opportunity to use that free cash flow to delever the balance sheet. But essentially at lower commodity prices, we're going to be spending cash flow to maintain operations as best possible. And as prices move up, we see that um, going to the balance sheet and further delevering. Just to put that into perspective, we see ourselves at, uh, at $45 WTI. We're able to sustain our operations in that 75 to 80,000 barrels a day. And, uh, and that would be investing about $300 million of capital, kind of 50-50 between our U.S. operations and our Canadian operations. So maybe, maybe I'll stop there uh, at the risk of rambling on. Uh, we can talk a lot about Baytex, but everybody's here. So I'll stop there. Great, Lars. Great, thank you. Uh, so Vermilion Energy is an internationally diversified company. Uh, to put it into perspective, we've got about 60% of our production coming out of North America for 2020, 35% Europe, 5% Australia. Production guidance for 2020 will be in the range of 94 to 98,000 barrels a day. Um, so, you know, I think what we really provide is a diversified uh, business in terms of commodity price exposure. The way to think about Vermilion from a commodity perspective is light oil and condensate is the primary investment in North America. Uh, light oil in Saskatchewan, condensate in Alberta, light oil in Wyoming. And then Europe, we do have exposure to Brent uh, crude as well as the European gas pricing side. Um, depressed Price environment here in 2020, I think the thing we'd like to point out is uh, strip pricing for European gas in 2021 projected to be in that $6 Canadian MCF range. Um, so, you know, I think that's what you get with Vermillion is that diverse, diversified portfolio. In terms of response to the pandemic, um, you know, I think the way to think about Vermillion's asset base is very short cycle investment in all three of our jurisdictions. So we started with initial capital guidance for 2020 of 450 million, we've now cut that back to 360 million. In addition, um, in the past, all of our free cash flow or a good chunk of it was used to fund the dividend. We have now suspended that. So in conjunction with the capital program, as well as some cost cuts through the rest of the business, you know, we've eliminated about $520 million of cash outflows from the business. So that's in Vermillion's response from a financial perspective uh, in response to COVID. In addition to that, uh, similar to Rod, we, we extended our credit facility as well in March of this year. That is a covenant-based credit facility, which is now turned out until May of 2024. And then as most of the folks on the line here would be aware, we have the high-yield notes outstanding. Those mature in uh, March of 2025. So a pretty good uh, maturity stack from that perspective. And with that, I'll turn it back to you. Great. So 
Lars, just um, you know, you, you will 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 circle back to you since um, you were just talking about credit and 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 um, and financing. I, I guess one of the big topics um, that we've seen in the last few years is the retreat of foreign players and um, partial divestitures or full divestitures. I think, um, according to Bloomberg calculations, as of last year, we had about thirty billion dollars in uh, foreign company um, divestitures and. Trying to understand what that means for a company like yourself, um, you know, for, for, for Vermillion, um, you know, is access to capital really that difficult? And um, what does that mean for the sector as, as you know, capital markets are shunning this, this um, you know, the, the, the energy sort of ENPs? Yeah, so, you know, I think we, we keep very close tabs on the majors in terms of their M&A plans or divestiture plans. I would say Historically, Vermilion has been an acquirer of assets from the majors in Europe, um, opposed to North America. So that's where we really try to keep tabs on that that group of uh, companies. Now, in terms of you know how you fund acquisitions, I think in the past there was a little bit more ability to access capital market, whether that was debt or equity. I think that access to capital markets is getting a little bit more stringent, expensive in this kind of environment. Um, so in, in addition to the asset attributes that anything would have to meet, we would also have to be delivering on our uh, balance sheet priorities as well. I would say our number one financial priority is debt reduction and leverage reduction. Therefore, any kind of acquisition, whether it was from a major or anyone else, would, would have to, to, to check the box on that uh, balance sheet deleveraging as well. Um, you know, I think you know, the advantage Vermillion has is the European franchise that we have built what that allows us to do is look at acquisitions where price is not always the number one driver in a transaction. Things like asset retirement obligations and indemnities around those, um, uh, reputation within Europe, a lot of those have a lot of value in Europe. So that you know continues to be an advantage for us um, going forward when as majors execute on divestiture programs. Right, right. And, and and Rod, you had talked about, I think the term you used was retooling your, your books or retooling your, your, your balance sheets. And um, you had talked a lot about, you know, free cash flow. I mean, how does one manage that? How does, does one manage that with, you know, prices at the levels in which they are in the sort of late 30s and 40s? And uh, how, how do you achieve that? No, good question. Um, it, it's getting a good handle on your assets and understanding um, where your margins are and where your profitable assets are. And um, you know, through the through the downturn during Q2, we had actually shut in about 25,000 barrels a day of production, and that production just wasn't generating a positive margin for us. And so, being able to be very call it nimble to um, move and shut down operations where you're not generating profits, and, and and basically reduce any any losses that you could incur. And so, um, we've got a great understanding of our assets now. We. We did experience the downturn in 2016, and, and through that, we, we also shut in production. But we bring that production back on as soon as it's going to generate a positive margin. And so um, it's really working closely with your assets and your field teams to make sure that you understand fully the operations and the cost structure that you have and optimizing that for the environment. But second to that is also relying on a good risk management program. And so um, with that, we refer to our hedging programs or our long-term contracts. And, and we lean on those contracts um, during periods of volatility um, to make sure that we have operational flexibility. And so um, I think we our teams have done a great job in terms of um, bringing production back on. Now we've seen commodity prices come back. Um, to some extent, and we, we've been able to bring essentially all of that 25,000 barrels a day that we shut in back online. Wow. And so for the question for the three gentlemen is, you know, what does your capital spending look like for 2021? What does your production guidance look like for 2021, given where prices are at the moment and given how you guys are thinking, especially since we're at the end of the year? Um, Derek, we could start with you. Sure. Maybe before I dive into the specific answer to your question, maybe I'll just um, pile on the theme that that the priority for our company is at the moment deleveraging, and um, mm -hmm. the the deleveraging opportunity for us is coming from uh, an ongoing maturing of the business. The the company was a private equity backed startup, and all of our growth has been organic, largely been organic. Uh, we went from a standing start to that two hundred thousand barrels a day that I talked about earlier. One of the byproducts of that was the 
corporate decline rate that maybe got ahead of where we would have liked it to be. So uh, a couple of years ago, we made a conscious decision to stop pursuing production growth and be more focused on economic return for shareholders and, and bondholders. Um, that, that slowing of the pace of growth has allowed our corporate decline rates to mitigate very substantially. And that, that's been our strategic direction for a number of years now. When we look going forward into 2021, um, we expect to see just have a continuation of what we've been doing for the last number of years, which is, in other words, holding productive capacity flat and uh, very relentlessly focusing on cost reduction. Um, that would imply that we'd be spending next year between 650 and $700 million on a capital program and, and holding production flat there. I think the real story there, though, is... Um, with decline mitigation uh, and with pretty significant improvements in the, the costs to drill, complete, and tie in our wells, our, our corporate financial break-even has been steadily coming down and is projected to continue to come down. A couple of years ago, we would have expected that we needed a $55 WTI world to sell funds staying flat. Coming into 2020, we now think we're around 42 Going into 2021, that's probably coming down a couple of dollars further. So uh, we're very, very much focused on making a business that's more resilient in more modest commodity price environments. The, the, the cost reduction that I uh, alluded to is pretty substantial. Uh, our, our drill complete tying costs for the first half of 2019 were just under $10 million a well. For the first half of this year, we were around 7.1 to 7.4 on the second quarter and the first quarter. So very, very dramatic cost improvement. Um, quite often people have been asking us how much of that is on the back of suppliers that are desperate for work because of the COVID situation. And my answer is, is none of it. All of those results were delivered pre-COVID uh, and really are a function of changing the way we've signed the wells and modifying the uh, the well designs and completion programs and doing some fairly aggressive work in terms of supply chain management and capturing some longer term contracts for some of the value chain. So, so as we look forward into next year and years beyond that, I would expect that our, our, our plan doesn't change very much. Continue to drive costs lower to the extent that we generate free cash flow. I use that to delever and when we hit our balance sheet targets, which I think we could probably hit within a year or two, then we'll revisit the opportunities to utilize that free cash flow, whether it's uh, dividend, uh, NCIB, or some modest degree of return to growth. But uh, next year looks uh, relatively similar to this year, just with a better cost structure. Got it, got it. Rod, how about you? Yeah, so similar to Derek, I think um, we've seen, you know, great strides in the business in terms of building efficiencies. And I think um, through one thing that's happened for us in particular is the downturns given us an ability to kind of reset production levels. And so we used to produce about 95 to 100,000 barrels a day. Now we'd be between 75 and 85,000 barrels a day. Um, and, and so <clears throat> with that, um, you know, and that's happened through a reduction in capital spending during 2020. But what that's done is we, we've actually seen a reduction in our overall decline rate, much like Derek has said. So we, we our corporate decline rate before used to be about 34%. It's probably down to 29% now. Um, when we set our 2020 capital budget, we would have had capital efficiencies that would have been about $17,000 a flowing barrel. We're now projecting that to be about 15,000 uh, a flowing barrel. And similar to Derek, where um, two years ago, we would have needed $55 uh, to sustain our business. We now see our business being sustainable in a $45 environment. Um, when we look at our plans for 2021, we haven't set them yet. We will set uh, our budget will be released in early December after we meet with our board. But uh, I think the key to the budget is it's going to be flexible. Um, in a lower commodity price environment, we're going to be spending less and trying to generate as much free cash flow or, or just spend cash flow at, uh, you know, definitely the low levels. But at $45 environment, we can actually generate modest free cash flow. 
and keep our business flat. And so we'll probably um, be going out with a program that's somewhat predicated on a 40 to $45 world, um, but remain adjustable or flexible um, should commodity prices change. And so um, the other thing that we do have, um, similar to, to both Lars and, and Derek, is we've managed to build up a bit of a hedge book um, for 2021. And right now we'd have over 35% uh, protection uh, at $45 WTI that actually allows us price participation up to $55 WTI. So um, we're feeling good about that protection. We'd like to have more, but um, we'll see where commodity prices go over the next little while here. Got it. And, and Lars, would love to hear about Vermilion, particularly since you guys have the international presence as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, s similar to the other two, you know, we took the drastic measures of uh, stopping the drilling program earlier this year. So from a production profile perspective, you know, that, that will have an impact going into 2021 in terms of um, no capital investment offsetting some of those PDP declines through the first, second half of 2020. From a decline perspective, you know, we can think of Vermilion kind of in that uh, low to, to 20% range um, in terms of what that decline level is. So I think we have an advantage from that perspective. And then, you know, because a lot of our investment is to is into either conventional or semi-conventional reservoirs, a lot less capital intensity than what you see in the unconventionals. Um, therefore, I think that we are able to, you know, remain nimble and, and be um, flexible as we move forward. I think in terms of 2021, you know, you look at 2020, we spent about 230 million of our 360 million program in Q1. I think there are some efficiencies to be had by level loading that throughout the year, utilizing the best rigs and that type of thing. So, you know, I think consistent with uh, Rod and Derek, you know, we'll be more focused on longer term profitability as opposed to quarter to quarter or even annual production growth. And then what that also allows us to do is to remain nimble. And if we have a commodity price environment that is lower than what Strip is suggesting today, we'll have to react, vice versa. If we have a commodity price environment that is higher than today, we'll be quick to react in, in that environment as well in terms of um, sort of balancing the capital allocation between the balance sheet, organic investment, as well as acquisitions. Um, and to follow up on that, um, Lars, you know, at the beginning when I asked if you this, this question, and Derek had mentioned, you know, cost savings from the technology side. Um, how, what are you guys seeing in terms of um, if, you know, cost savings from um, oil field service providers? Obviously, it's been a sector that's, um, you know, been been hit very hard. Um, and wanted to see if, you know, when we talk about cutting expenses and, and you know, ha have we gone to the bottom in terms of the service providers yet? Um, is there more savings there in, in, in that aspect? You, you know, um, similar to the other two, you know, we, we haven't had have, haven't had much of an active program sort of since COVID has taken impact. I would say, you know, there's not a heck of a lot more that service providers can provide from a cost saving perspective. I think the way we look at it too is our operating cost budget is approximately $450 million in absolute terms. Um, that is much larger than the $360 million capital budget I think that we'll look to there to make some more structural savings. Now, savings on, on that side of it take longer. They take some investment. There's no sort of silver bullet in terms of something that you'll see next quarter type thing. But I, I think that's where the business will really refocus is, um, you know, on the operating side of the business as these capital budgets get shrunk and shrunk. Understood. Yeah. Um Want to turn it over a little bit to M and A and consolidation. Obviously, we um, are seeing some of that in the U.S. and um, you know the, the, it's been long talked about in uh, up in Canada. Um, Rod, what are your thoughts? Do you think that we are ripe? You know, the Canadian uh, basin is ripe for a, some sort of major wave of consolidation, some sort of um, some sort of M and A. I think, well, I think we're starting to see some transactions um, take place, but I, I think, um, you know, both Lars and Derek touched on it uh, a little bit in terms of when you do look at a transaction or an asset acquisition, um, for us in particular, we focus on asset quality and, and how that asset's going to compete within our portfolio. We, we have, you know, over 10 years worth of, um, you know, um, organic drilling opportunities on the lands that we hold today. And so any asset acquisition that we would look at or M&A transaction going forward, 
um, you got to look at the attributes that are that are there, and and you don't want to just just do a transaction. You know, historically, people have maybe um, looked to grow by transaction, but I would say people are looking for definite synergies and reasons for transactions to happen, and and they've got to tick all the boxes, whether it be um, you know operational synergies, uh, capital efficiencies, GNA savings. Um, maybe the balance sheet in terms of um, fixing things there. But um, I think there is going to be more activity, but I think it's going to be very um, transaction specific in terms of making sure that all the boxes are ticked um, for the money managers when they're looking to make sure that the transaction does make sense. Yeah, yeah. Derek, what, what are your thoughts on this topic? Yeah, I, I think that there's a, there's a, a very recurring theme right now that um, with the uh, commodity price reductions and, and the resulting valuation reductions, oil and gas companies are diminishing investor relevance. And it's harder and harder to get investor attention as uh, companies, even Exxon, are falling out of major indices these days. So there's there's been a fairly, as I said, recurring theme that, that scale is important just to counter that. I think um, I think I subscribe to that theory. Scale usually comes uh, not only with uh, relevance, but it comes with efficiencies, comes with possibly product and play diversity and geographic and political exposure diversity. Uh, all of those are are potentially valuable things. And then uh, and then I'd repeat what Rod had to say, as as a company like us thinks about M and A. Um, for sure, there's different buckets of value that you can try to capture. Uh, potentially valuation re-ratings from scale, uh, potentially the, the synergies bucket. Um, when we think about M&A and uh, where we might most appropriately capture synergies, it would likely be uh, consolidation within the Montney. But for us, when we look throughout the Montney, uh, we're already the most liquids rich producer in the Montney. Uh, we, we have a longer term bullish outlook on the way condensate will behave. Uh, so to, to consolidate within the Montney would minimize our exposure to that, that particular, particularly strong product. Um, potentially that can be counterbalanced with synergies. Potentially uh, if you get enough scale investment grade is on offer. Uh, and that's of course in, of interest to the, the viewers of, of this uh, panel. I, I think that there will be more uh, m and absolutely I think most of the transactions that you've seen to date have been transactions where one counterparty is in distress. What you've not yet seen is combinations where two strong companies are coming together. I might uh, say Devon and the WPX are, are the, uh, the example that uh, proves me wrong there. But um, generally, you've not seen strong companies combining. I think that that's going to be the next step um, for us. In order to to move forward with M and A, we need to find something that competes with our internal inventory, and frankly, that there's not very much. Uh, the, the rates of returns and the PIRs that are in our internal inventory literally are amongst the best in North America, and we've got um, probably 20 plus years of identified inventory in the upper and the mid Montney. There's an emerging play in the lower Montney that could add five to six to seven years to that inventory if it continues to develop the way that we're seeing it so far. We don't have a need for uh, uh, M&A uh, per se if there's a way to make our company better. Uh, and by better, I mean uh, more, more capable of delivering free cash flow throughout different points in the commodity price cycle. We might be interested, but it's a pretty high bar for us. Yeah. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so I want to run into a quick lightning round. Um, how is this going to work is Derek, Rod, and Lars. Um, I'm going to do it in that order, and I'm going to ask you a question. I want one or two word answers if possible, and want to get a quick thought and no explanation. Are you guys ready? <laughs> sure. All right, let's start. Let's start here. Um, what number, w WTI, do we need to see across the board growth again? Derek. 50 plus. Rod. 50 plus. Lars. 60. What in, uh, do you think that by mid year 2021, we're going to see the a big industry wave of industry consolidation? Derek. No. 
Rod? I'm agreeing with Derek again. <laughs> no. Lars? No. Okay, biggest political risk, biggest political risk going into 20, the year end 2020. Derek? Uh, Biden winning the election. Rod? Uncertainty over the election. Uncertainty, one more word. Okay, elections. Lars? I agree with Rod, hung election results. <laughs> um, okay, biggest, biggest, biggest political risk going into 2021. Derek? Uh, exposure to uh, retreat from uh, um, support of the hydrocarbon industry. Okay, Rod? Yeah, along those lines, just more uh, more regulation and uh, that that is basically adding cost and incremental um, you know challenge to the industry. And Lars, yeah, I'll stay on theme. Uh, re regulation that doesn't align. <laughs> okay, I got two more for you guys. Next pipeline that will come into service between uh, KXL TMX. Line three replacement or line five? Derek. TMX. Right. I think line three. Line three will be first. Lars. I'll go line five. <laughs> and last question. Will we see, and I'm not even going to say $100 oil, but $80 oil in the next five years? Derek. No. La Rod? I don't necessarily think we'll see 80, but we're going to see a more constructive environment because the uh, the investment that's required in order to keep things going has definitely gone down. And Lars? No. No. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for joining me. Um, this is a, obviously a, you know, would, would love to spend hours chatting more and um, uh, this has been a very, very insightful conversation. Thanks, gentlemen. And I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Robert Tuttle. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Robert Tuttle. I'm a reporter with Bloomberg News. Um, I'll be uh, moderating this panel today on Canadian midstream, on the midstream sector. Um, it's uh, fairly well known that Alberta has a problem with too few pipelines to get oil out. Uh, but the issue is, is kind of bigger than that. Uh, very large networks of pipelines, rail lines, and storage terminals are required to not just get oil out of Canada, but to get hydrocarbons into the oil sands themselves. Um, tight oil and gas producers in western Alberta, they drill for condensate and gas that must be transported to northeastern Alberta. There, the gas is used to steam oil sands reservoirs, and the condensate is blended with bitumen uh, to, to make the crude oil that's then exported. And that, uh, that, that oil has to be shipped south by pipeline or rail to refineries as far away as the U.S. Gulf Coast. Now, the recent collapse in oil demand because of the pandemic has sort of thrown this whole system on its head. Um, so we have the representatives of three companies involved in different aspects of this supply chain with us today. Um, first, we have Cameron Goldade. He is a vice president of capital markets at Pembina. Uh, his responsibilities include corporate development, corporate planning, investor relations, treasury and cash management. Before joining Pembina, Cameron, Cameron spent 11 years in energy-focused investment banking. Uh, Beth Pollack is vice president and treasurer of Gibson Energy. She joined the company in 2015. Uh, prior to uh, her time with uh, Gibson, uh, Beth had over 10 years of experience in investment banking, corporate banking, and consulting for energy sector clients, most recently with RBC Capital in Calgary. T Tony Alocino, I hope. Uh, is Chief Financial Officer at CES Energy Solutions. Before joining CES Energy, he was Managing Director of Global Investment Banking for Energy at Scotiabank uh, Global Banking and Markets. 
Uh, he has over 20 years of experience in finance, capital markets, mergers and acquisitions, and coverage of the North American energy services industry. So I'm just going to start um, by asking each of you to introduce, um, you know, introduce yourselves, if I didn't do that very well, and introduce your companies in particular. So um, why don't we um, uh, start with you, Cameron? Thanks, Robert. No, that was a fantastic introduction, and, and hello to everyone who's on the webcast. You know, I think maybe just to, to spend a couple minutes on Pemina. Uh, Pemina, for those of you who don't know, uh, is a transportation and midstream service provider. Uh, we've been in, in business for 65 years now, uh, you know, largely serving the Western Canadian sedimentary basin, although in, in the past few years we have expanded uh, beyond that, and, and we have a few straws now into the U.S. basins. Uh, our focus has always been on integrating our services, so providing multiple services to customers across the value chain. Uh, we find that that uh, for us is a competitive advantage and, and also enables our customers uh, security and, and uh, timeliness of service. We also focus on uh, getting our customers' products to the highest net back markets in the world, whether those be locally or, or throughout the world. Uh, this has been fundamental to our strategy over time and has been a, a large part of the enabler of our growth. Uh, from a financial perspective, uh, I would characterize Pemina as a, a conservative uh, and, and, and diligent company. Uh, we pioneered the financial guardrails uh, for our company back in 2016, which are really the promise for which Pemina makes to its investors in terms of how we'll approach different aspects of the, of the capital structure and, and the financial makeup of our company as we uh, go through cycles and, and capital projects. Uh, I'll talk more about those, no doubt, in, in uh, the questions, but um, that, that's uh, that's a good snapshot of them. Thank you, Cam. Um, Anthony, how about you? Sure. Uh, thanks a lot, Robert, and thank you uh, to Bloomberg for including us in this panel. Just so everybody knows, CS Energy Solutions is actually a manufacturer of chemistry used primarily in the energy industry. So we're not as much of a midstream player as, uh, as Pembina or Gibson. However, half of our revenue is related to production-related chemistry, which is very much recurring and has very similar cash flow attributes to the midstream revenue and cash flow streams of the midstreamers. So we are headquartered in Calgary. Uh, we manufacture chemistry that gets used to solve problems for the producers uh, while they're producing oil and gas streams and while they're drilling for, uh, for, for uh, new wells. And uh, that chemistry is advanced. It's, it's manufactured through a vertically integrated business model where we buy, buy raw materials primarily from Asia and some Europe and North America. We get those basic uh, molecules. We react them under temperature and uh, pressure profiles. And then we sell them to our customers to solve their problems and to make their production and drilling activities even more economical. About half of our revenue is production related. Uh, revenue in 2019 was 1.3 billion Canadian. About 75% uh, of that was in the U.S., where we have a very strong presence in the most prolific basins, including the Permian. And obviously in Canada, very strong presence in, uh, in the uh, Deep Basin, North Montney in particular, and the oil sands. So when we look at the business, we're CapEx light, asset light, which uh, makes our cash flow generation very strong and gives us some of those defensible midstream-esque uh, financial model attributes, which has been attested by the, uh, the rating agencies that cover us, where we were one of the only energy service companies in North America to be reviewed during the COVID downturn and uh, not be downgraded. So both SMP and DBRS maintained their ratings that were in place pre-COVID based on our cash flow business model. Thank you. Yeah, that's interesting. How about you, Beth? Tell us about Gibson. Thanks, Robert. And uh, and also thank you and Bloomberg for having me here today on behalf of Gibson to share a little insight into our company. Uh, so Gibson is an oil-focused infrastructure company. 
uh, we did undergo a significant transformation of our business over the last three to four years, which some people uh, watching today will probably be familiar with. But today we see ourselves as having among the highest cash flow and one of the strongest financial positions among our energy infrastructure peers. Uh, the transition of our business greatly improved our credit profile and culminated also in two investment grade uh, credit ratings in 2019, something we we're very proud of. Uh, from a cash flow perspective, 80% of our business is from our infrastructure segment. Uh, and this is really underpinned by take or pay or stable fee for service uh, structures. Um, as we think about our infrastructure business, the bulk of it is terminals. These are at Hardesty and Edmonton in Alberta. Uh, we have 12 million uh, barrels of storage in, in uh, Hardesty, and we have uh, just under 2 million barrels in Edmonton. Uh, Hardesty is also, I think it's noteworthy to say, going to be the site of our diluent recovery unit, which we're building right now with the partner that we have in our rail facility uh, and for our customer, ConocoPhillips. Uh, this is going to be the first of its kind in Western Canada and a very exciting uh, endeavor for our organization. Uh, and outside of terminals, we have a network of gathering pipelines. We have a Moose Jaw facility, an emerging position uh, that's uh, quite small in the U.S., uh, in a marketing organization which optimizes our infrastructure assets and also markets the refined product from Moose Jaw. Um, to echo, uh, or maybe we're following in uh, Cam's footsteps here, but uh, having a strong financial position is also very important to us. Uh, we have uh, and manage our balance sheet in accordance with our financial governing principles. Uh, might sound a little familiar from his financial guardrails, um, but uh, we've got leverage uh, right now of 2.4 times, which is uh, actually below our target range of three to three and a half, which really reflects our bias to be conservative and uh, be at the low end of that range. Thank you, Beth. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start by asking, I mean, the obvious thing that's going on now is that uh, the, the oil and gas industry has uh, suffered a huge loss in demand like no other time in recent history because of this pandemic. Here in Canada, more than a million barrels a day of production came offline. Um, Anthony, I mean, your company works with drillers and that, that sector has been particularly hard hit uh, requiring some tough steps, I'd imagine. How did you guys adjust and how did you do uh, adapting to this situation? Yeah, that's a good question. So we, number one, our company, just like the, the companies of my peers, have been through these downturns before, 2008, 9, 2015, 16, and we're uh, currently in this, this downturn that uh, we are getting through. So the way we coped with it was, number one, we came into it with a very strong balance sheet, which ended up being a, a significant competitive advantage and working with the drillers and that volatile part of our business that represents about half of our revenue. Uh, we know very well in Canada, as the audience may or may not know, it's already very seasonal. So we are very comfortable with adjusting our cost structure, which we did very quickly in both Canada and the United States. So we were able to remove about 25% of our employee-related costs, uh, personnel-related costs, very quickly on an annualized basis. And that allowed us to bring our cost structure down. And then the next thing that we did, because our, uh, our drilling business is, uh, is working capital intensive, really focused on optimizing that working capital. And what should have been a very big weakness ended up being a strength. We were able to harvest over $116 million of working capital just during Q2, during the, uh, the depths of the downturn, and uh, went from a draw on our senior credit facility to a, uh, a cash position of $40 million when we reported Q2 in mid-August. So it's something that we've seen before. We acted very quickly on. We have a very strong balance sheet. We have a resilient balance sheet that allows us to harvest that working capital, which puts us in an enviable position to, uh, to act aggressively while many of our competitors are falling by the wayside. Yeah, thank you, Tony. That's interesting. Um, 
Cam, you guys are in the kind of in the mid. You're in the midstream sector. I guess you've seen your volumes affected by this, but um, still, uh, how are you managing with this downturn, and how's it looking going forward uh, for you guys? Yeah, thanks, Robert. Uh, you know, you're right. For us, the, the 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 eye of the storm was really in early May. Uh, you know, we started uh, when when April came on. We started uh, hearing a lot of talk, obviously within the industry, about this concept of tank tops, and you know, a, a, a lot of uh, discussion and consideration around that. Um, what we ended up seeing was volumes really hitting a trough in early May and actually recovering uh, quite well through the latter half of May into June and July. I think it's important for uh, the, the viewers here to remember that, you know, the summer months are, are typically a seasonally softer period in any year uh, for volumes in, in Western Canada, largely due to the winter winter predominant drilling that occurs. And so most of our, our customers or many of our customers are doing their drilling activity in Q4 and Q1. Uh, so we see volumes typically increase uh, in Q1, uh, soften through the year and increase again in Q4. And, and this year appears to be no different, notwithstanding you know the, the dislocation we've seen from COVID. Um, but broader than that, I think what we've observed from our company is, is twofold. One has always been a focus on, on the geology underpinning uh, the assets or underpinning our customers. And, and for us, uh, you know, we've heard our CEO say that if, if we had to rebuild our assets again, we would build them in the exact same place because they sit on top of some of uh, the most prolific geology in North America. Uh, we have that benefit. Uh, we also have the benefit of, of some strong contractual underpinning. Uh, for our business, uh, approximately 70% of our earnings come from contracts with our customers, which are either take or pay in nature or cost of service in nature, meaning uh, we have volume protection uh, or, or, or downside protection through those contracts. And, and as a result, uh, you know, with, with where our customers were uh, before the COVID pandemic, we were generally running, uh, you know, just above those take or pay levels in, in most of our businesses with that commercial construct. And so what it really did is, is create a bit of a floor for us in the near term and offer uh, actually some interesting operating leverage uh, coming out of this pandemic as we start to see volumes recover. So we were very pleased with how we how we persevered through this. Uh, we, we made a, a, a prudent decision to defer some capital uh, to preserve our own uh, financial strength as well as the strength of our customers and, and the safety of our communities around that. And coming out of the back of this, uh, you know, we, we feel quite happy with uh, where our customers are sitting from a financial perspective and, and where Pamina is as well. Thank you, that's interesting. Well, Beth, I mean, your company is uh, is, is very significantly in the storage business. Um, and we all saw how storage tanks and everything else that could hold oil filled up to capacity a few months ago. Um, I think from uh, looking, you're, you had a very strong second quarter in terms of cash flow. Um, and marketing arm did well. Um, how has this downturn been for, for you guys? Well, for Gibson, we were very certainly very pleased with the Q2, uh, with the Q2 high water mark of 94 million. Uh, it was a strong quarter for us and really allowed us to strengthen our balance sheet and continue to enhance our credit metrics. Um, that being said, uh, when we look at COVID, the impact really was uh, modest to our company and reaffirmed that successful transition of our company that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it showed that we were well, in fact, well positioned to withstand challenges facing the sector. Uh, similar to what Cam said, we did see volumes come off in May, but we saw them come back online by the end of June. So all in all, on the whole, uh, our Q2 results were in line uh, with Q1 pre-COVID. Uh, where we did actually see some weakness was on the uh, conventional non-oil sands part of our business, but this really only comprises about less than 5% of our overall uh, business. And volumes here were about half of what they were pre-COVID uh, and have been quite uh, slow to recover. Um, notwithstanding this strong quarter, though, we still take a very conservative approach to our uh, planning processes. 
and we're still looking at it in terms of the run rate uh, marketing uh, marketing uh, levels of 80 to 120 million. And uh, this is where we're fully funded and comfortable we can deliver. Uh, in terms of actual capacity at our tanks, as I mentioned earlier, most of this is contracted tankage uh, and it's used by producers for operational purposes. And so for that reason, we didn't have space to provide uh, to people for opportunistic short-term uh, tank opportunities. Uh, and for that reason, we had the stability that we did. Uh, and um, But at the same time, our marketing division is actually able to use tankage, which they do in the ordinary course of business, whether or not it's at Hardesty or Edmonton or Moose Jaw. And they did, and they were able to take advantage of that contango curve. And that's what we really saw uh, reflected in our results. Okay, well, thank you. That's interesting. Um, I guess the the I want to look south now a little bit. Um, there's two things happening in the uh, there's two things I want to ask about the U.S. Obviously, if we see a a Biden presidency, um, you know, in, in recent years the Canadian uh, energy space have kind of been seen as disadvantaged from a regulatory tax perspective from versus their southern uh, our southern neighbors. Um, but with the Biden presidency, there could be a new focus on environmental concerns. He's pledged to stop fracking on federal land, uh, pull the permit for Keystone XL. He may, we don't, we, we could see slowing of permitting for pipelines, LNG terminals. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, Tony, you're in, you're in both sides of, you work in both areas. I mean, what do you, what do you expect from if there's a change in administration in the U.S. for the business? And what does it mean for Canada also? Will Canada be more attractive now? Yeah, so just starting off with the U.S. and this concept of politics. Politics are politics, and we've already seen some backtracking by the Democratic Party from the one extreme, which was a total ban on fracking, to, uh, to now they're talking about potentially limiting or eliminating fracking on federal lands. So it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly what's going to happen in the near term, because the reality is nothing is going to happen in the near term. Uh, but there, there will be a, a shift in policies for sure. So just focusing on some of the most concrete statements, which uh, have really revolved around a limit uh, or elimination of fracking on federal lands. Uh, when we look at a company like ours, CES, uh, we, in fact, uh, generate about 90% of our activity in the U.S. drilling market from private lands, not federal lands. So, uh, so the effect of something like that on us would be less, way, way less pronounced than perhaps some other players. And the other thing I would add to that is, uh, is these producers, if there's an economic model, will still need to drill and frack and produce, and they're going to do it on private lands. And those are places that we're at already because that's where most of our activity is. And uh, we're very good at it because we spend a lot of our time there. So we're not so fussed by what we know is quasi-concrete. However, there is a wild card in the medium to long-term uh, policy changes as they relate to, uh, to clean energy and, uh, and acting on fossil fuel-related policies. And that kind of thing takes months, if not years, to unfold. So we'll act in accordance as they unfold. And in Canada, um, Canada still, from a, uh, a production perspective, has something that uh, the U.S. needs and U.S. refiners need, and that's, that's heavy oil. Those refiners, refineries, are designed to take that, and it would be very expensive and cost prohibitive to change them. They've lost a lot of supply from places like Venezuela and Mexico, and as a result, need what we're able to provide them. Unfortunately, we have to do a lot of it by rail right now, but uh, we expect uh, saner minds to, uh, to prevail and, uh, and revisit the safety aspects and the efficiency aspects of those pipelines. Thank you. And, and Cam, I mean, as a midstream company, I, I actually kind of want to pivot this a little bit. Um, you guys were had acquired the uh, Kinder Morgan's assets in, in Canada uh, uh, recently, and um, I'm kind of wondering, like, uh, do you see opportunity to expand in the U.S. in the 
in terms of acquisitions, uh, I think Canadian midstream companies tend to be a little healthier on their balance sheets than their U.S. counterparts. Uh, do you see some opportunities there? Yeah, it, it's a good question, Robert. Um, you know, the the U.S. Uh, the U.S. is always interesting uh, because obviously there is a very prolific geology uh, in the lower 48. Uh, you know, things like the Permian and the Bakken are, are definitely uh, clearly world class geology. Uh, you know, Pemina today has a, a small position in the Bakken. Uh, you know, sort of uh, through our our pipelines, uh, the. Vantage pipeline and the Alliance pipeline that that service uh, in some way, shape, or form those basins. You know the challenge for Pemina has has always been when we've looked in the U.S. Uh, you know just on a screening basis, you know, you're always looking around at what's available. Uh, what we've observed is that the the commercial structures, uh, notwithstanding that ge the geology is very strong, uh, just haven't stacked up quite as as robustly as those that we're used to in Canada. Uh, you know, I talked about in, in my early comments, uh, our high take or pay percentage, um, you know, in, in past uh, that just hasn't really matched uh, what we've seen in the US. And so notwithstanding uh, the valuations that are, are, uh, are, are occurring in the US right now, uh, it, it's just hard to see that risk proposition uh, in this environment. Okay, thank you. And Beth, I guess I'll, you'll be, uh, what about you guys? What opportunities do you see down there? We just have about a minute left, so. Um, I think I think uh, if I think about the different questions you've asked here, as we look at a at uh, the outcome of or the potential outcome of the U.S. election, which obviously we wouldn't even uh, endeavor to predict. Um, I think Gibson's in the in the fortunate position of having visible growth regardless of who's elected and regardless of, uh, of what occurs with pipelines, for example. Uh, there's a significant opportunity for a DRU project uh, in rail, which Anthony alluded to, should uh, the pipelines not proceed. If pipelines do proceed, uh, there's a lot of opportunity with respect to tankage at Edmonton and or Hardesty uh, for our organization. Uh, in terms of uh, acquisitions, as uh, which you had spoken about with CAM, uh, we just uh, completed a transformation of our business, which included a significant effort to clean up uh, the impact of various uh, acquisitions. And so that's not something we're looking at doing. We're quite comfortable with the organic growth uh, and building at a five to seven times multiple uh, versus paying somebody for work that they've done. Okay. Well, thank you very much, all of you. I had so many more questions I wanted to ask, but we ran out of time, I'm afraid. So thank you again, and, uh, and I appreciate you uh, spending time speaking about your companies today. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you for the having... opening bell has rung on the London Stock Exchange, and gold prices are already soaring. Investors here in Germany are moving more towards safe haven assets. And here in Canada, precious metal commodities are reacting. Let's take a closer look at how this will impact your portfolio. Understand the world impact on the Canadian economy as BNN Canada's business news network joins forces with Bloomberg, the leader in global finance. The all-new BNN Bloomberg. Local insights. Global power. Hi, I'm Kat Trawick with Bloomberg's Energy and Commodities team. And with me today, we have three great panelists who I'll introduce briefly here. First, we have Julian Deschalais, a managing director in Brookfield's Renewable Group, one of the largest publicly traded renewable power platforms with more than 19 gigawatts of capacity. Next, we have Todd Stack, the CFO of TransAlta, which is one of Canada's largest producers of wind and Alberta's largest producer of hydroelectric power. And finally, we have Beth Summers, who is the Executive Vice President and CFO of Superior Plus, which distributes and markets propane and distillants and supplies specialty chemicals in North America and elsewhere. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm gonna to kick things off with a COVID question. We're obviously in an interesting business climate right now. So can we just start off with you telling us a little bit about what your financing strategy looks like and any challenges or opportunities you've seen during the pandemic? We'll start with Todd. Oh, great, thanks. So, so Transalta, thanks very much for, uh, for having me on the conference as well. Um, it's great to be here. It's a pretty exciting time at Transalta and, and just to 
as we came into 2020, uh, the company was actually in really, really good shape financially. Um, we had, I think, about a billion seven in liquidity coming into 2020, and currently still sitting on about one and a half billion. Um, uh, we've, um, our, we've, the last five years, we spent a lot of time deleveraging the balance sheet um, and focusing on asset level financing. Uh, we had closed a tax equity financing right at the end of, of 2019 in December, and that really was the final step of financing that we needed to get through the entire uh, 2020 capital program. So what we're doing right now is we're looking at a, a project financing um, uh, right now on one of our Australian assets, and that one really is setting us up for the 2021 uh, financing uh, plan that we have. Great. Beth, same question. Yeah, I think from our perspective, um, similarly, uh, right now we're somewhat holding tight and we're being opportunistic. I mean, I think from our perspective, we do have a healthy maturity profile right now. Um, we don't have any significant maturities until 2024. Um, you know, with the, I'm going to say record run that we've somewhat seen in the high yield market, I think from our perspective, we would potentially access if the rates went low enough from our perspective for it to be opportunistic. Um, so again, you know, I would say we are monitoring bank markets, however, and that's fundamentally just looking at extending our credit facility. Historically, we've every year extended it out. Um, at this point in time, you know, typically we would look in sort of the March, April time frame. So needless to say, that wasn't an ideal time to be doing anything from a financing perspective. So we um, somewhat, you know, looked at it. We knew that there was premium pricing and frankly, shorter tenors. Now, we can be opportunistic there as well. We'll keep monitoring it. But uh, again, it doesn't um, mature until 2024 as well. So again, you know, hold tight, be opportunistic is really busy year. Um, and speaking to your question, um, we've had, um, you know, we maintain one of the the best balance sheets in this in the strongest balance sheet in the sector. At a, you know, we maintain a triple B plus rating, uh, and we maintain well over $3 billion in liquidity. So this was a, um, a time that we um, wanted to capitalize on. And when I look at our capital structure, uh, we've been pretty busy over the last nine months. Uh, we've basically raised uh, $775 million Canadian in the bond market, um, of tenors of 10 to 30 years. We issued our inaugural uh, PREF, perpetual PREF in the U.S. market. Uh, in addition, uh, we've raised over a um, billion dollars in the project bond market. So it's been a good year for us, um, and uh, we're looking to do more before the end of the year. Julian, a uh, question for you. What is the best market right now in the U.S. or globally for financing power projects? Yeah, I would say generally um, there's... Um, meaningful amount of capital um, being deployed in our sector um, globally. Um, we've seen uh, strong markets in Canada, uh, the US and Europe. Um, and so I would just generally say that um, this asset class uh, is one um, that um, has um, seen a significant amount of capital that being deployed to. And so Financing good projects um, it, on, on good terms is, is definitely achievable currently. Related question to that, and Todd, feel free to weigh in here also. Um, with regard to the U.S. market, Bloomberg New Energy Finance has put out a forecast saying that they're forecasting a U.S. clean energy capital shortfall of about $23 billion as the pool of tax equity financing dries up. So my question for you is how critical is tax equity financing to U.S. renewables development right now and going forward? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, so we have uh, tax equity is, is important to Transalta. That's how we financed uh, the big level project and the Antrim project, uh, as well as some of our prior wind farms. We have half a dozen um, early stage, mid stage development wind projects. Um, you know, about a thousand megawatts, a little over a thousand megawatts, and they they really do depend on tax equity. So, 
Um, having that market come back uh, to life uh, is is important for financing for us to be competitive against uh, you know those people who can make make use of the uh, the production tax credits and other benefits down in the U.S. So definitely very important. Just just to right. echo on some of the uh, you know capital markets in general, um, you know, as, as Julie mentioned, the U.S. the U.S. Uh, you know debt debt markets are very deep, uh, very supportive of good projects. Uh, contracted projects, and so are the Canadian markets. So even throughout the COVID crisis, we didn't see or really see any disruption in ability to raise, uh, you know, financing for good projects. Are you expecting that pool of financing to sort of rebound after this year? On the tax equity side? Yeah. Um, yes. I, think, uh, I think 2021 might be uh, a recovery year. Um, I don't have a great forecast or I don't think there's any clear views and you know it was the banks and the financial institutions that were the primary players in that in that market. So I think it's yet to be seen uh, what their full year 2020 will look like and uh, and when they'll be back. But you know I am I am hopeful that they'll be back. You know sort of to the latter end of 2021. You know I guess yeah, what I, I would add there. Sorry, yeah. What I was going to add there um, is I think tax equity still is there. It has been there this year. I think uh, maybe a little more selective. I think. Again, for good quality projects um, with good offtakes um, and with institutions that have that you know you have strong relationships with, I think here in times like these, relationships are important. And so, um, as long as you're maintaining good relationships with those tax equity providers uh, and have good projects, you're still able to source um, you know competitive tax equity. And that's what we've experienced in, in our projects in, in New York and in California this year. Got it. I want to touch on ESG a little bit. It's something that our clients are increasingly sensitive to and asking about. So two of you, TransAlta and Superior Plus, you uh, your businesses are dependent on fossil fuels. And I'm wondering if you are at all looking at transition financing as a way to diversify your portfolios or clean up your portfolios. Um, I, I mean, I think I can take that question on sort of overall the trends and where propane fits within the market. So certainly, I mean, we've seen a shift to higher carbon emitting or a shift from the higher carbon emitting type fuels, um, you know, in particular from how it would impact us, sort of diesel, heating oil, um, shifting then to sort of greener fuels and from a carbon emitting perspective, Propane is sort of similar in that to natural gas. So, well, you know, it's still carbon emitting, it is less. So it does benefit us as a propane distributor because we do see, you know, our supply to businesses and communities does help them um, from a transition perspective um, as they move towards their carbon targets. So, I mean, internally, we're obviously addressing similar to other companies where we can, from a fleet perspective and being more efficient with certainly our logistics, but as well as converting our vehicles to propane vehicles, which are, again, less carbon intensive than some of the other fuels, clearly. So, again, you know, we're seeing legislation and it's a bit of a challenge. From our perspective, we are a good alternative for generators and other places um, and as a result of that, um, we are a good transition fuel and lower. So from that perspective, um, you know, we view that, you know, longer term, obviously we have to keep addressing and, and moving forward. But, uh, it, you know, the move from that carbon emitting is pushing it towards where our fuel can help people achieve their goals as we go through a transition. Yeah, I'll just I'll just add. Um, you know, last year at our investor day, we um, we set out our strategy over the, for the next couple of years, um, allocating about half a billion towards renewable projects that we're currently you know shovel ready and, and ready to go. And some of those are under construction, and uh, a couple should be coming online here very soon, including uh, our first battery project. And on top of that, we we allocated about nine hundred million dollars for converting our our coal units into natural gas. Um, that um, that program is underway, and actually our first unit is is under outage right now, and should come back up in a couple of weeks on 100% uh, natural gas going forward, um, with the with remaining units sort of tagging along uh, sort of in the next calendar year, so that by this time next year the the amount of generation from coal will be you know very minimal minimal if any. 
Um, the conversion to natural gas even opens the door for further technologies on um, uh, carbon capture or hydrogen, which are you know very interesting uh, evolving um, uh, technologies that uh, that I think will be a big part of the solution. But they're a long, they're they're a ways away. So Beth, it sounds like um, you are pretty bullish on on the distillate business or propane anyway, um, performing even as investors become more concerned about climate change. Um, so I'm curious how you see that business evolving, let's say over the next 10 or 20 years. Yeah. I, and I mean, I think it's <clears throat> when you just think about it, I mean, propane fits basically as a necessary remote fuel. Um, you know, it has its place in areas that aren't serviced by natural gas um, or where electricity isn't viable. Um, it's certainly a very good alternative where there are things, if there is a natural disaster or in instances where the electricity grid isn't working, um, certainly it, it provides what we have seen is a bit of an uptake in areas where people want to use solar panels for homes, et cetera. Um, and in those particular instances, it's good as a, as a backup generator. So again, when you refer to distillates, distillates typically um, in our business would be heating oil. And that's certainly is something that as our business, we have divested a lot of our um, distillate assets and would continue um, basically helping convert sort of heating oil, heating in houses, um, et cetera, to propane, which again is, uh, is lower carbon. I often like to say, if you think about propane, think about it like portable natural gas. Since you bring up backup power, um, it, I'm reminded that we've had a lot of pretty significant natural disasters here in the U.S. In fact, we're now we now have a category for hurricane that's heading for the Gulf Coast. We've had wildfires, we've had blackouts. Um, so I'm curious if this changing climate situation and in more extreme weather events, how you're sort of factoring that into your business strategy. Yeah, and, and I think from our perspective, we would we would look again to the um, backup generation. I mean, this is also, if you want to think about it, just simply from a remote communities, um, from a Canadian context. Um, a lot of times you have diesel generators. Uh, propane generators um, certainly have been developed such that that is a like less carbon intensive um, opportunity. And again, and you know, is, is transported by, by rail, transported by truck if there isn't rail access. So when it comes to the natural disasters, et cetera, again, this is where you get back to that. It's good as a backup or a redundant um, generator. And again, when you think about homes, smaller businesses, commercial type businesses, uh, I think you also have a benefit as you start seeing it where you can, <clears throat> if there are difficulties to build, build grids, et cetera, you do have the ability to use propane. Um, there are instances actually where we do use it as a gas grid. Um, there are instances in Western Canada where you do have entire towns or strata communities that are supplied by propane. Um, so when these things happen, I mean, it, the, being a remote fuel that can be transported um, not with a large grid, it, it is helpful and will, you know, take its place, right, as a, as a remote fuel that does work in a lot of instances. Todd, would love to get your thoughts on that. If, if you have any concerns about the risk that extreme weather events presents to your assets or uh, even your, your ability to distribute power. Yeah, I think um, we have a broad range of assets and, and so, there's really a mix of, of grid connected generation. Um, there's a combination of behind the fence um, and, and a, a fair amount of remote operations that we have down in Western Australia. So security of supply is always something top of mind. Um, a lot of our remote operations are for industrial customers or, or even a lot of our behind the fences, industrial customer supply. So, so certainly um, the facilities are designed to operate with certain amount of natural disasters. Our facilities in Australia are you know cyclone ready. Um, and have gone through a number of cyclones uh, even during construction. So uh, definitely something to keep in mind. Uh, we did have some you know, very serious flooding events here about uh, five, six years ago in Alberta and our hydro facilities. Um, I won't say they were undamaged, but they performed very, very well during those, those flood conditions. So 
always top of mind uh, to keep uh, to keep ready and, and keep reliability of supply. Just switching tracks here a little bit, Julian, um, I wanted to ask you about the prospects for publicly traded yield codes after Brookfield absorbed Terraform. Should we expect to see more of those at some point or has that moment passed? And if we sh if we will be seeing more under what conditions, what conditions would be needed for that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say um, to a certain extent that yield code model and the proposition and uh, the return proposition that, that came along with it with this, you know, 15, 20, 25 percent growth annually um, just isn't what isn't a sustainable or wasn't a sustainable model, I think. And, and that's where we sort of saw an opportunity when we looked at a Terraform uh, and the acquisition of the Terraform business. We saw that as sort of an opportunity to take fundamentally a very solid uh, group of assets and solid business, but with, um, you know, outsized sort of growth prospects and, and take that into our business and uh, have a more manageable sort of growth tra trajectory and very much more of a focus on growth for value as opposed to growth for the sake of growing. So. I think there is an opportunity, um, I think, for us to continue to acquire businesses such as Terraform going forward. I think the yield co model, I think, has pretty much, I think, passed. I think you're seeing uh, other um, types of businesses at a smaller scale. There's a lot of talk around SPACs and so such uh, going on right now. Um, but I think... Um, to answer your question, I think there are very few yield codes left, and I think the way uh, things are evolving, um, there will be less and less going forward. Great. Switching again to talk about the Paris Agreement, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about um, what the Paris Agreement will look like in a year or two, given China's announcement that it plans to be net zero by 2060 and the prospects of uh, the U.S. rejoining the agreement under a Biden administration. So I wanted to get each of your takes on what implications there might be for the power industry under a, a revamped Paris Agreement. Maybe if I could start on that one. I think, um, you know, the outcome of the U.S. elections, um, uh, for us, the way we see the, the business um, will have limited impact on the business. I think there's really, there is a broad movement right now towards decarbonization. Um, and it's in the US, it's in, it's happening globally. Um, so clearly what we're seeing is not just central governments sort of setting ambitious targets, but we're seeing now states and, you know, US states, we're seeing municipalities, we're seeing corporates set very ambitious carbon reduction targets. Uh, and so we see significant growth coming out of that. And we also see um, another meaningful point, I think, that people sometimes overlook is that the cost of wind and solar uh, asset is now sort of on par, even in many markets, below the cost of, of, of generating power on a fossil fuel basis. And so it really makes economic sense for everyone involved to buy uh, renewable power or invest in renewable power assets. So um, I think although politics and, and will help and, and uh, governments will help in sort of setting the strategic direction, I think um, we're seeing a broad movement that will just further accelerate uh, the decarbonization of the grid and create opportunity for businesses like ourselves to, to continue to grow. Potter, Beth. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just jump in. Um, I, I would echo everything that, that Julian said. Um, uh, the trend toward ESG, the trend toward clean generation is, is full speed ahead. Um, so I don't see that slowing down. I see the demand from customers, from investors, uh, and from and for governments as well. And, and um, you know, similarly, regardless of whichever, you know, party comes into power, um, you know, we're, we're, still optimistic that there'll be lots of opportunity for, for wind and solar development. Clearly under a, a Biden administration, uh, um, the amount of money flowing into the industry will probably be much, much larger 
that could create tremendous op more opportunity and or even more dollars into you know research and development of new technologies. So it's, it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, you, ha you have to echo, it's quite clear um, the movement, regardless of, you know, longer term, regardless of who's voted in, you're going to continue to have this, I'm going to say path to a less carbon intensive economy. So from that perspective, I mean, it is coming and it is something that's there. Again, from our business perspective, um, being a remote fuel and less carbon intensive than other options that people are currently using um, in these instances, we are a good transition fuel. So from that perspective, certainly from a vehicle perspective, um, propane vehicles are less carbon intensive than um, typical um, fossil fuels used to drive vehicles. So from that perspective, I mean, there's certainly a role to play in the transition as we move towards that less carbon intensive. And I agree, there's a lot of opportunity in the business as you look at renewables and as that change occurs, um, where to move as entities, there'll be a lot of opportunities that everybody can look at and certainly play as we go forward. Great. Um, we are about out of time, so I am just going to wrap it up here. I want to thank you all for taking the time to chat with me. It's great to hear from you. Um, really appreciate it. Um, I also want to say thank you to everyone who's watching. This is the third session of the Bloomberg Canadian Fixed Income Series. And I want to thank you for watching. And also a huge thank you goes to our sponsor, National Bank of Canada, for helping make today's third uh, session possible. Um, during the next session, which will be on October 13th, we'll shift gears a bit and focus on the public sector with comments from Steve Polaz, the former governor of the Bank of Canada, Jason Kenney, the premier of Alberta, and Eric Girard, finance minister of Quebec. So that is going to be Tuesday, October 13th at 11.30 a.m. Eastern. For more business and financial news from Bloomberg's Global Newsroom, please visit Bloomberg.com. And remember to follow us on Twitter at business. Thank you again for watching.